That's the first question we asked when we started the company. We said, who are our learners and what are their motivations? Hi, everyone, and a very warm welcome to this exclusive conversation. We have today with us So Young Kana, founder and CEO of Nobi, uh, a pioneer in mobile micro learning and micro authoring platform that helps uh, leaders and professionals perform better. It's a pleasure to have you with us, So Young. Thank you so much for having me. It's a joy to see you again. Same, same here. So tell us a little bit, and I have a lot of questions about what's happening in the space of learning. And as an entrepreneur in the space of learning, what do you see as trends? And we're going to go through them in detail. But tell us a little bit more about what's happening on your site. And there's a lot of excitement sure. news. So tell us a little bit, what's the big uh, change from business <laughs> what's the perspective? Big thing? Um, yes. Absolutely. So um, for those of you who've been following us in the news, uh, you may have noticed some uh, a big announcement that was made a few weeks ago. Uh, Nobi has decided to earmark $10 million in scholarships to give away uh, to anyone who's watching or listening who wants to develop skills in micro learning and instructional design. So it's really the marrying of instructional design research and science with technology in a way that I think we've never really seen before. And so we developed a certification and an accreditation program. And while we used to charge for the certification in the past, we've decided to give it away for free. And the reason why we're doing that is because we want to accelerate developing digital skills and build confidence for people to be willing to try new tools to better communicate, engage, train, and interact in more human ways. Because I think we're getting a little bit zoomed out and we're getting a bit tired of really the dehumanization of what's happened with COVID. And I think as we're hungry for human connection, um, Nobi was designed to encourage human connection. And so we want to teach people, how do I do it? Well, I don't know how to do that. I would love to do that. How do I do it? So we've launched this uh, scholarship program to for all of you who are saying, I want to do it, but I don't know how. And so it's a free scholarship for you to do that. So this is a very big announcement we've made. Um, and then the second big announcement related to that is um, that we are really focusing a lot more on how can we equip you, the creator? And who is the creator? The creator is the leader, the manager, the L&D professional, the trainer, the coach, the mentor, the person who is creating experiences, shared experiences for their teams. And we want to empower the creators with better tools and better experiences and better support and better pricing and a better business model in order for them to have the tools they need to design and deliver the best experience. So we're very excited that uh, that's already in beta. So everyone has now free access to our dashboard and can start playing around, creating and tracking the engagement of their teams today. Awesome. Awesome. Congratulations. And it's really exciting to see that, that this opportunity is open to everyone. What's the timeline? So for anybody who's listening, uh, what, what's sure. the timeline for the application? First come, first, come, first serve. We've oh. already had thousands of applications. Awesome. awesome. And uh, we have allocated 20,000. So once our applications are full, then it will close. Awesome. Awesome. All right. So everyone who's hearing us uh, see the opportunity and inviting everyone to go to Novi's uh, website. And I'm sure the information will be there on how to how to be part of this opportunity. So thank you so much for sharing that. Yeah, so I, I would probably um, uh, think that a lot of the changes that you just shared with us are also kind of reflection of things that you are seeing at, uh, in the space of learning and technology at that intersect that you were referring to. What's happening, you think, in, a, in our space that it's triggering this, this change? What, what's, what's a pre-COVID and a post-COVID learning <laughs> and technology space change? And it's probably, uh, you know, almost like 10 years have gone through instead of just one and a half. I know, right? It feels like it's been decades. I think we've all aged a bit. But I think the <laughs> one thing that has uh, come out of COVID is really um, and I think we've always valued human connection, but I think COVID exact made that need even stronger. And you know, while there was an acceleration to technology, people are, I think, increasingly saying technology in enough is not enough. We need humanizing technology 
technology that enables us to connect better with our audiences because we still can't travel. You and I are still across the screen, but if we can use technology to help us feel more connected, interact before our webinar and even after our webinar, not just during, but even during, right? How do we create those connection points before, during and after in a way that is more human? And I'll just give you a very simple example. Um, yesterday, I was invited to give a keynote speech in person to about 200 people. And my topic was interactive learning experiences. So I said, okay, well, can I use Nobi to do my interactive learning experience talk? Because I want it to be interactive. And they insisted I use PowerPoint. So I'm on the stage in front of 200 people with a PowerPoint deck behind me talking at the audience. I tried my best. I gave two giveaways and I got people to hand, raise their hands and participate with me a little bit. But um, I walked away knowing no one in that group. I spoke and then I left. So I now have no connection with those 200 people in the room. Had I had technology like Nobi to do my interactive talk, I would now have 200 new friends that I could connect with today. Yeah. And continue the conversation. And continue it doesn't the end. Conversation. And they could have access to all of my slides and my content, and they could have used them for their teams. And I was happy to share with them, but I don't have their email addresses. I'm not yeah. going to, I don't know how to get in touch with them. Yeah. I could have gotten to see their faces before I showed up and I could have found out what questions they had and addressed yeah. them better in my talk. So yeah. I have no, because I don't have that feedback loop as a speaker, I'm kind of paralyzed. I can only yeah. talk at them at best. And it was not the most human experience, even though, so the use of technology in this case would have humanized the experience. And so I think what we're realizing, hopefully through COVID is that we need human connection. It's not enough. And I think that the, the broader trend I really hope is happening in the learning space is it's not enough to do learn by knowing. Yeah. Enough, let's, let's stop talking at people. He, adults are smart, intelligent human beings. We need to think we need to reflect, we need to engage and participate. So let's evolve to learn by doing, and ultimately let's get to learn by teaching. Beautiful, and I'm, I'm gonna stay to that second point, but before you do, before we do that, I, I love your point about uh, COVID has taught us this human connect is not just about being in front of somebody physically. And I, and I love your example because you just kind of show how even pre-COVID, the fact that we are together in a physical space, that doesn't mean we are no. actually connected. And no, I think through technology, we can we can take the best of this whole uh, year and a half of, of disconnect and actually plug it into the physical world and use technology to humanize. So thank you so much for sharing that real example and so visually help us understand how technology and physical can, can come together. So on your second point that you were talking about corporate learning and the need to change the mindset, tell us what are the big challenges that you see in corporate learning? And, and, and I know if this data is correct, but I read somewhere that there is globally more than $400 billion being invested in corporate learning um, yearly. And where is the ROI? What's the impact? <laughs> What are those challenges? What are the problem statements for corporate yeah. learning as a space? Well, I laugh, right? Because um, I come from, uh, I, so before I became an entrepreneur, I was at McKinsey and I was leading the performance uh, transformation, a, a service line for McKinsey. So I'm all about impact ROI analysis. And um, when I entered the corporate learning space, I recognized that many people were trying to measure the ROI but we're struggling. And so I think this is a perennial challenge. I think yeah. some uh, professionals do it a lot better, take a much more analytical approach, and some still are using surveys and happy scores. So I think there's definitely a wide spectrum of people in the space in terms of measuring. Um, what, what I would say is um, I think every, every uh, learning experience should have a specific set of design outcomes. And those could be qualitative or they can be quantitative. And so I think it's important to really think about the different learning objectives we're trying to achieve and then what tools and resources and technology can we use to help track that impact better. Uh, what I would challenge people to do is when they think about kind of learning outcomes and measurement, 
is to start with what are you trying to measure first? And if happiness and satisfaction is the one level, I would challenge us to move it up to another level. So in Kirkpatrick, there are four levels. Um, there's a knowing, there's doing, right? So being, so I would challenge us to look at higher levels of impact uh, towards application of knowledge in terms of actual behavior changes. In fact, in terms of actual business impact. And there are ways to design the learning experience to drive those outcomes better. So from your perspective, is this corporate learning space not impactful just because of a design problem? Or what, what are the problem statements you see? Is it a design problem? Is it a focus problem? Is it an understanding of what we really need as an enterprise? What, what are the different big challenges and how would you classify them? Sure. I mean, I think obviously every organization is so different. So that's a very big question. You know, you have very sophisticated, you have open minded, uh, uh, really pioneering and people who I learn from all the time who are quite amazing. And then you have people who are, you know, using a little bit old style. I would say one of the biggest challenges is a mindset challenge. So the mindset challenge is I've always done it this way. So I think that almost the biggest force we're fighting with is inertia. So inertia is I do a training program. I use PowerPoint and I have a class and I have one to 20 and there's a certain format of way that I've done it. I have survey forms that I print out and I do all this stuff manually and then I have post-its, right? So there's a certain method and a way that I've done things and then I take my survey forms and then I analyze them and then I report them back. And I've done this for 20 years and this is what's worked for me. So now I think that the biggest challenge is a mindset of, wait, can I do it differently? Can I do it better? and how, what it would it take. So there's a mindset, I think, challenge, which is a big one. And am I open to trying something new? And so one of the things, you know, that, that we've done a lot at Nobi is when we show the, the people the slide of all of the steps that learning and development people are doing every day, they're like, oh my God, that's a lot of steps. Imagine if we can use technology to automate and make it easier for you. Oh, is that possible? Right, and then it's really, okay, but it's so hard, I don't, I'm not a techie. Well, neither am I. Right. I did. I created Nobi because I'm not a techie. So it's meant to be easy enough for someone who's a, not a techie like me to be able to do it. And so if I can do it, if I know if you know how to use PowerPoint and you know how to use social media, you can use Nobi. Right. And so the whole idea was to make it so simple that anyone could do it. And once they did it, then it would actually foster and encourage thinking more creatively about the experience. So I don't think we spent I think we spend so much time on content that we have forgotten about the learner experience. And think about every amazing um, professor or teacher you've ever had in your life. Right? Yeah. That person, it didn't even really matter what they taught. The, the subject of what they taught was in some ways less important than how they delivered that class. For me, it was my fifth grade teacher, Mr. Wahlberg. I think his background was in art, but you know what he taught us and how he engaged with us in the classroom with bringing live animals in, having like redesigning the art, the, the classroom with grass, like fake grass in the middle of the class. He redesigned the whole class and every day we would have an hour of reading time like on the fake grass, you know? So I remember those parts of the learning experience and that's what has stuck with me all these years. In some ways, he's one of my motivators for designing Nobi, right? Because I wanted Nobi to be that kind of a tool that gives the creator the flexibility to design that kind of an experience. And so to bring the human into that technology versus the other way around. And so I think when you're doing that, it's, um, it's elevating obviously the experience for everyone. So I think we have a huge opportunity to take those $400 billion and elevate to the effectiveness and the experience of those on the other side by investing more in learning experience and technology design for experience than just learning for learning's sake. So from the perspective of the, and, and, and I'm going to move quickly because I, I, I would yeah. like to go deeper on the learner experience that you're referring to. But before we do that, just to close the corporate training um, bucket, what's the readiness of, of the buyer? Because one is about changing the mindsets of the creators and the, and the, and the trainers, and which I think uh, that's one battle that I think through technology and organizations like yours can yeah. accelerate that shift. Now, what about the corporate buyer, 
uh, looking at learning in a way that even a pre-COVID way, how is how are you seeing that change? Are organizations a lot more open to ex- experiment, to to take bets, to try new things? What what's been your experience? Yeah, and I think again, it depends obviously on the company. You definitely see a whole mix, but you are seeing I think companies who are more open to experimenting. Um, but I I think they're still they're starting to experiment. I think there's still a lot more they can do on experimentation because they still tend to lean towards the safe choices. So there is a very, very strong momentum to just doing what everyone else has done before because I don't want to get in trouble. And yeah. if I innovate and pioneer, I could get in trouble. If something goes wrong, something then... goes up, right, right. So I think depending on your corporate culture, so I think my encouragement is to step out of that and be willing to innovate and try new things. Um, and, and also rethink the way we measure impact as well. So I think that's where um, I, I, there definitely have been companies that have gone both ways. You know, I think post COVID, I think many have become way more open to testing and pioneering, which is fantastic. Um, and then really seeing, oh my God, this, I didn't even know this was available. I think it starts with a learning mindset. And if we have a learning mindset when we are, uh, no matter COVID or not COVID, I think all the time, right? And if we were to foster a culture of learning constantly, I yep. think it would really help uh, accelerate the development and the upskilling even of training professionals. Yeah, wonderful. So just quickly, would you help us understand what when you say we have to change the way we look at impact, what, what would that mean to you? How do we break from that, you know, tick in the box mindset of, you know, measuring as opposed to really truly knowing that it is making a difference what, what are some of the lead indicators and lack indicators to again change? it depends on what you're what you're doing right so if you're doing let's say i'll just take an example um we're doing a, a, a lot of uh, we have a lot of trainers who or leadership trainers in nobi and a lot of coaches who use nobi and the reason why they use it is because they do their leadership and they have a lot of reflections and applications they build in for the part for their coachee or their um, you know leader to go through right, and then they're engaging with them, and then they're really tracking the behavior changes of how that leader is evolving on the job, and then we have an assessment pro, a 360 tool that they can use that they can get feedback from other people on how they're performing right, and so that's then tracking not just the leadership development program but the impact they're having in the organization. Right. So those are ways that you're basically tracking beyond. Do they know something about leadership? Because leadership is one of those things. It doesn't matter how many books you've read on leadership. You can te- you can get 100 percent on a test and be the worst leader in the world. Right. So it's about what are you? How are you practicing? How are you living it out in your life? And how is the impact? Uh, what is the impact you're having on others? That's way more important. So that's just one example. Another one could be a design thinking project. Right. You run a design thinking project and you have all the project stuff in Nobi. You lay it out at the end of it. Did you create a product that was innovative? Did that product work? Was it not? But you're going through the process together and the technology is just guiding you on the process of getting there. It's not replacing the innovation or the thing you come up with. And so I think that's where as we think about um, learning itself, obviously project experiential participatory learning um, is going to definitely drive higher results and then you measure then what is the business outcome is it a new product is it a new behavior is it a new xyz and then how does that translate into business value ultimately yeah so what i hear you say is that then measure is is really bespoke to what you're trying to change of course it should always and, yeah and, and 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 that creates the challenge and then that through technology you can customize or, 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 or make sure that whatever measure of success is is unique for that intervention. Of course. And, and you know, it's technology, but it's just a multitude of tools. I mean, technology is not going to solve all your problems, but it can be an enabler to support the multitude of ways. So I think that, um, so I used to be an expert in performance, right? So one of the biggest mistakes people make is they start with indicators. There's no such thing as a common set of metrics and indicators. Imagine if everyone tracked to the same indicator, that would be a problem because uh, they're by definition, a metric is an indicator of something. It's an indicator of a key performance outcome you're trying to get to. But if you haven't designed or defined the key performance outcome you want, how do you have an indicator? You're going backward. That's the, that's the, right, that's the tail pulling the dog. You want to start with what are you trying to accomplish? Then what are the right metrics to use to accomplish that and to measure that? So I think we sometimes 
um, don't understand really how to use metrics in the most productive way. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. Wonderful. And how do you connect that to what really matters to learners, which is finally going to be uh, growth, promotion, increases, yeah. salaries, you know, better opportunities. How do you link that to finally, yeah. you know, the hard part of uh, what matters to a learner? Yeah. So it's a good, good question. One of that's the first question we asked when we started the company. We said, who are our learners and what are their motivations? And um, we found in the learner personas, some who only learned for promotion, they are achievers. Some who learned because they just love to learn, you know, whatever you give them, they, they, they just eat it up. Like, Can I have extra bonus materials? And then you had some people who learned socially because they just like to share knowledge with yeah. other people. They like to share what they've learned and the books they've read. And so because you have, you know, different learner personas, I think it's to recognize that uh, your, your learners are not all the same. They're different. So when I'm designing my program, my curriculum, even, even using the tech to design my experience, I need to kind of recognize that all learners are not like me. So I need to adapt my learning experience in order to meet as many people as I can. So tell me a little bit more about uh, that experience design and, and you, you pioneered this concept of micro learning instructional design and, and tell us a little bit about what it means and, sure. and also how does that help the learner get engaged, but also more importantly, the, the outcome of the learning to be achieved? Of course. So, I mean, I mean, we did not invent instructional design, right? It, it's been around for, there's been, you know, 30 years of research on instructional design of how to design a learning experience for effective outcomes, right? I mean, and a lot of the instructional design, I think, started a lot in, in kind of face-to-face -face, in classrooms, right? In different pedagogy for children and andragogy for adults. So instructional design is teaching you the science and the theory of different techniques that have been honed and refined over years around facilitation, engagement, right? Not talking at people. So all of these things we've actually known for a long time. And then we had that. And then you have technology that was developed. But a lot of the traditional e-learning tech did not apply instructional design methodology into the tech, which is why we ended up with video-based talking at people kind of e-learning. That is not grounded in instructional design. So what when you have good learning outcomes, the science of instructional design is what leads to better outcomes for the learner. The tech, it's not the tech, it's the instructional design part. And so what we decided to do is apply that instructional design research to the micro learning format and technology so that we still maintain great outcomes from the learner side. Engagement, effectiveness, retention, higher pass rates, all that, because it's the instructional design that's being embedded into the tech, not the tech itself. That's why when people say, oh, micro learning, oh, I, I do micro learning. Oh, so you take 60 minute video videos and chop them up into one minute. Is that going to be more effective? No, it won't. I'm sorry to say, 70% of organizations are using micro learning some form now, but they're just doing bite-sized content. That's just social media. That's like Twitter feeds. Twitter is bite-sized content. Facebook is bite-sized content. Does that make me more effective? Arguable. And instructional design researchers would say no. If you really want someone to really learn something, they can't just go through lots of bite-sized information. They have to process it using instructional design methodology. So that's, I would say the big, it, it seems like, and it sounds strange for it to be an innovation, but it's so critical that we marry those things together. And the truth is many L&D people um, don't have a background in instructional design. And so I was talking to um, the head of micro learning at a large MNC and, and, and you know, he said they have 400 L&D professionals in his company. It's one of the top uh, tech companies. I won't name the name. And he said, my guess would be about 90% of people 90% uh, of my L&D colleagues have no background on instructional design. And so I think that's where some of the biggest gaps are. So I think that that's a great opportunity. And so that's why we launched the scholarship so that we can teach people the basics of instructional design and then how to apply technology to that. Lovely, lovely. So, so what I hear you say, and that takes me to the next question, that it's really not the content and the content is available and the content is probably you know, accessible to the learner already, but it's how do you design that intervention 
to really create those aha moments in the learner. So then there is a shift. So if, can you give us an example of, you know, as you mentioned, not micro learning is not just about taking the one hour and breaking into smaller <laughs> parts, but w- what would be an example of a great instruction design of, of any of the projects that you worked on that you say this is just yeah. a... So a strength just- finder, strength finder is a good one, right? So I can read a book on strength finder and I read it passively and I'm like, oh, interesting. I get knowledge around that. Have I really changed my behaviors as really let's say probably not unless i'm really really diligent right i usually pass so now when it's nobified what happens is i'm going through and it asks me what are your top five strengths so i go through and i'm like these are my strengths so it's kind of like a coaching tool in your pocket where it goes okay tell me what you like about this strength Mm, but that someone's designing that right and then i'm like well i like this part about my strength or i don't like this where do you struggle with it where do you see examples of it struggling in your life Oh, well, here, 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 here. Can you upload a photo of yourself of how you feel when you're operating at your best? Then I have to go find an image and I upload a picture of how I'm feeling, right? So now I'm expressing myself in the process and I'm engaging with the content. So I'm making it mine. It's personal to me. It's not just a general book or general piece of content. Now it's my personal learning. And as I'm contributing it, if I'm working my team, I'm sharing with my team. And then my team is saying, oh my gosh, Esther, that's totally right. I see that in you. And I, I've noticed that in you. And I, I totally think that resonates. Or I would have thought you were a different color or whatever. right? And then you're actually having this dialogue and you're just using it from your phones. right? And as you're having this kind of a dialogue, now my understanding of myself and your understanding of me is totally deeper than it was by just reading a book or by hearing a lecture talk about StrengthsFinder in the abstract. So I think that's just an example of making that human connection. And we have actually dozens of authors who've nobified their books. And I asked them, um, one is a, is a, she's a head of innovation uh, professor. And I said, why did you nobify your innovation book? She said, well, I want to bring my book to life. Yeah. And I said, oh, she said, I want a human connection with my readers. And I said, that makes sense. <laughs> and so she's no, she nobified her book for that purpose. And we have uh, other authors who are nobifying their books now because it's just about, it's not about the tool itself, but it's about the desire for the human connection yeah. and the participation that people are looking for. Yeah, yeah, wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, So Young, for that. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to invite you to take us a little bit in the future. Sure. And, and as you're in the middle of, of this transformation and you, you've had the opportunity to, to be an insider in this industry and also see what's happening, when you zoom out, what do you see coming for, for the learning and development space? What, what are some of the big shifts that, that you see from your vantage point? Sure. Well, I think that obviously um, there's a few things. So I'll talk at the There's a mindset shift, right? So the mindset shift, I think, is the most important of having really a growth mindset and a pioneering mindset to constantly learning, right? So the irony of learning is that sometimes we're not always learning, right? It's an L&D professional. So it's a constant mindset. I think that's a starting point. Then on the technology side, the technology is evolving. There's the metaverse, there's AR, there's VR, there's different technologies and tools out there, tools like Novi, right, that are new. So it's, it's really about experimenting and then understanding the technologies and not to be scared of it. Not everything is going to fit. Not everything should be put in the metaverse. Not everything should use AR, VR. Not everything should use micro, you know? So it's really just about understanding then and having more agility over the technology so that you see those mega trends coming. And so it's about embracing and then the tracking and measurement and impact. So I think um, really getting a bit more um, sophisticated and skilled and upskilling ourselves as professionals on the, dis- on the, on the analytic side on instructional design. So I think there's some core new capabilities, hopefully that are gonna emerge in this space that are gonna require us to elevate ourselves as professionals. I think every LND person should understand instructional design and, and micro learning like MID, right? Because it's core to facilitation, it's core to teaching, it's core to training and communicating. So um, I think as we build out the capability and skill set, both from a technical skills, but also the softer skills, um, I do think that that's going to continue to evolve and I'm excited about, you know, I guess being part of that. Wonderful. 
Great. So thank you so much for your time and inviting everyone to, to go to Novi's uh, website and look up for this opportunity to invest in yourself. And thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you so much for having me, Esther. Thank you.